coming this morning. Uh, I'm Carrie Saunders. I'm an instructional designer at the University of Idaho with the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And I've got my colleagues here, Cassidy Hall, Greg Clifford, and um, we're going to just kind of tell you a story this morning about how we uh, support the Zoom tool and kind of walk through how it evolved over time and um, kind of the journey of how we got there and what we're doing now to support this, this um, particular software. So, University of Idaho in Moscow, um, we wanted to see if you guys knew very much about it instead of just telling you all, this, all the good stuff. So, we got some trivia questions and I've got some Northwest Met Bucks to give away. You can Google if you want. Okay, when was University of Idaho founded? Any guesses? It was it was it in the 18 you're getting getting closer eighty nine did you google <laughs> you're right who said that eighty nine I thought you said eighty nine that's it you're right <laughs> which was which was actually before Idaho became a state which Cassidy knew and I didn't know that yes yeah, you knew that. Mm -hmm. Okay, how many students? Approximate. Approximate. 534 across all campuses, 10,000 She's got, she's got it dialed in. She's got it dialed in. She's got us dialed in here. All right. Two more. Which, uh, which athletic conference? And this was recently changed. Big Sky. Yes, who said that? Mm -hmm. Carrie. That was that was quite a controversy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a newly selected UVI president. Anybody know a couple claim claim to fame? Yes, they have. <laughs> he's, he's not. He just a couple tidbits about him, I guess. I'm not looking for anything specific, but he's anybody know his claim to fame? A couple unique things about him that I thought we're worthy of a question. Anybody? Now that's going to be a little bit harder to find. <laughs> but it has been publicly released. Yes. And he was actually the ASUI president when he was a student. The second time he was president. Yeah. You can just guess if you want. Scott Green. Good job. And then I have actually one more question, or one more tidbit about him, which is that he is an alum. So that was the other kind of interesting thing. Okay, one more question. Does anybody know what this is called? This is a beautiful sidewalk that goes, <laughs> what do you say? It's, it goes up to the admin building, and I get, I get to walk on it every day. It's really pretty. The the what? No, it's not the burrito. It's you're close. Close. No, no, no. Any guesses? Yay! You got it. You got it. Mm -hmm. It's called the Hello Walk. And traditionally, the president would walk on this, this sidewalk to greet students at the beginning of the semester. And it was kind of a fun thing that they did. But it is gorgeous. And in the fall, it turns all golden leaves are falling. It's really pretty. One of my favorite things. A lot of squirrels. <laughs> so we wanted to tell a little bit about how we got to this place of using Zoom. And we kind of have a, have a crooked pathway that we followed. but. Um, we've got Greg here to tell us kind of how 
how it came to be that we're using Zoom and supporting Zoom. So I want to tell the story. Alrighty. I'll put this on for yeah. the recording purposes here. So I've been here for 22 years, so that's why I get to do the backstory. <laughs> <laughs> so like a lot of people in the ancient times of video conferencing, right, we started out with bonded services, could barely get a 384 call put together, you know, using ISDN lines, CLI codecs that were as big as microwave ovens, that kind of stuff. So we had a hardware bridge back in those days and it got to, it got old. So around 2013, 2014, we started saying, we, we want to get out of the standard definition. We want to get out of the hardware bridge business and they cost a lot of money. So we started looking at cloud bridging services. Uh, we initially went to Scopia, a Navaya product. Uh, I think Scopia got a little bit of a bad rap because our hardware was starting to get old and failing and everybody blamed everything on Scopia. So there was an uprising of, of sorts at campus and they're like, you know, make this work. Give us some video conferencing that's reliable and that we can, uh, you know, afford. So we did an RFP and Jeff Kimberling in our engineering department. He was one of the people that helped on RFP. Also people from our centers in Boise and Coeur d'Alene, they participated, some other people in College of Law. So we had a pretty, pretty diverse group across campus looking at products. And Zoom came to the top of the list as being something that would work for us. And so we did an initial, I think we invested about $20,000. We had enough licenses that we could have 50 people lit up at once plus all of our classrooms so they have a room connector option for the 323 stuff and we got that going and it took off like wildfire people were like oh this works it's pretty easy to use um, but then they started on their own discovering this is really easy for me to use on my other endpoints I don't have to just go to one of your rooms I can use my phone I can use my laptop I can use my desktop uh, screen sharing was super easy you didn't have to you know, go through a lot of rigmarole to do it. So people are beating down our door all of a sudden saying, more licenses, we want pro licenses, give us pro licenses. So we kept incrementing and incrementing and incrementing. Finally it got to the point where we said, we just need to buy a site license. So we did that. So we went from our original small scale up to having, now we've got about 2,400 staff licenses, 12,000 student licenses that are included. We've got capability of doing 125 webinar with 500 seats each and people are using it for just about everything even the people that were using uh bb learn collaborate they said that nah, zoom's easier we're gonna do that instead so they're doing that yeah yeah so that's a little bit about how we got there so um i guess what we represent is okay oh, is the three Oh yeah. So we represent the three different departments on campus that support Zoom. And so I, I don't know if it, it was more like just stumbling into how we were going to support it together, but we ended up having a lot of overlap and we, we made sure people weren't falling through the cracks on, on learning how to use it, making sure it was seamless, making sure that they were using it efficiently and knew how easy it was. So that's kind of how we approach it. Um, so from a course delivery standpoint, we, once we saw this explosion of people wanting to use this, this easy to use tool, great user interface, very reliable, we saw that they were starting to put it into their online uh, course delivery options. Very inconsistently, as you can see. <laughs> yeah, and so for example, we have this instructor in spring who has a face-to-face -face class, classroom meeting, and she's also offering a section of it as, as a virtual meeting with Zoom. So um, from an instructional design, design standpoint, I might say, you know, this, this description may be a little bit um, technical for a student to understand, but at the back end we make it work. And with this instructor, we're helping her to make sure that, you know, she's got all the tools she needs to offer this, these two sections together. And the students can, can meet, the ones that are online are there, the ones that are face-to-face -face are there, and it all works together seamlessly. Okay, so Greg's got the dashboard. We're going to just talk about stats and 
we talked about this explosion of use. Yes. Um, this kind of shows, do, do, is the dashboard working? So you can see on this that um, this is just showing how meetings have gone up, go back one, how meetings have gone up uh, in the last few months even and how um, it tends to explode over time. And then uh, Greg has the power to access all that admin information that we don't. So here it is. <laughs> Do you want to say anything about it? Um, yeah, so this just gives the admins a little bit of a quick view of what's going on at any particular piece in time. Zoom likes to group things mostly by the month, but you can see that we just had 24 newly registered people this month and the, since the 1st of April. We've got about 2,858 total people registered right now. We can see who our top users are. We can see where people are calling. Looks like India's running a close second to the U.S. This, it was China the other it day, was it was Vietnam the day before, so it changes all the time. Um, it graphs out what people are using, whether they're using Windows, Mac, whether they're using 323 endpoints, whether they're just using the phone to dial in, or their personal devices. Um, the Zoom customer satisfaction trend looks awesome, right, 100%. <laughs> um, so you can, you can pick whether or not to send out a little survey at the end of your conference. A lot of people don't bother. So yeah. it, it usually looks like, oh, man, we're perfect. But they're, you know, every once in a while we get some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> That's the number one stat we use from this, right? Right, satisfaction right. Survey. Yeah. yeah. That's all that matters. Let my director know, 100% satisfaction. So anyway, that just gives us a quick thing. And up at the very tippy top, too, um, where it says meetings, we can very easily look at uh, what's going on today. There's 20 meetings going on right now in progress. And if we need to, we can drill in on those meetings and we can look at packet loss and things like that to see if there's any problems going on, try to figure out what happened. And letting our faculty know that we have this power within Zoom is really important because if we ever have a faculty member that has a bad connection, then they know, hey, you can reach out to somebody in Zoom support and say, um, you know, can you check into this meeting that I had, why it was such a bad experience. I've done that before. And they're great about checking in and saying, well, the end user, you know, was relying on Wi-Fi that doesn't have enough bandwidth. And, you know, so they can give you tips on how to improve that the next time around. So as far as training goes, um, we try to do, Cassie does a lot of training on Zoom, but mostly it's just on one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody calls and says, hey, I don't know how to use this tool, or we'll come to their office and show them, kind of walk them through the steps. But we also have a BB Learn help page where we just walk through it step by step. But again, I feel like it's so easy that most people don't need, you know, don't need a, a really um, detailed uh, training session or tutorial. When we first got it, we did several trainings. We would have really high attendance in those, but um, so it seems like it's dropped off a little bit. Like people are pretty confident. Yeah, I, I try to consistently offer them each year just because we have faculty that hear from other faculty this is going really well and I'm now going to start teaching my course online. So we've had a lot of that in certain colleges in the past couple years. So I try to keep consistently offering it and I usually offer like a sort of intro to Zoom right where we're just getting used to where are all the buttons and how do I use this thing and then I or um, do one that's about advanced features for people that are actually teaching or running movie meetings in there so that they know like everything that's available a lot of people if they just use zoom on the surface don't know all the tools because they're not automatically activated in your account you have to go in and set those up in settings so making sure that faculty are um, aware of all of that is really important Yeah, and so um, one of the things that people get confused about is the scheduling part of it. And so we just tell people, you know, don't don't schedule a meeting for every single session, but instead just do this um, no fixed time recurring. method, the recurring meeting, and that seems to work really well. Um, as long as they can figure out how to do that, then they just have one link they need to share with their students. 
and then the link never changes. Right. Like, that is so important for a student, yes. right? If they don't have to look on that week's agenda to see what the new link is. Yeah, exactly. Keeping it as simple as possible. There it is. And then in BB Learn, if you look on to the right side here, um, the typical way that we have students um, join sessions is we just put it into the BB Learn course space as a link, and then um, they're usually directed to that either with an announcement or with uh, by going logging into their BB Learn session at the beginning of the semester. And then profile tab is the one that a lot of people use just for. All, all semester long. Okay, and we've got this meeting owl method that we've been using. Yeah, so um, I talked about the meeting owl when I was here last year because I was talking just about cameras in general and the um, Doceo Center's lending of cameras. And uh, the meeting owl is honestly something that Greg saw at a conference and he texted me and said, you're going to like this thing. <laughs> and I ordered two like immediately and I said, okay, there's one for me and one for you. Yeah. <laughs> the nice thing about doing that is uh, Greg gets to look at it from his perspective, like security and IT stuff, all that stuff, and I get to say, hey, how can I use this as an instructor? <laughs> okay, so we kind of um, rush into that together. The um, meeting now has been great for uh, on-the-go meetings, and meetings don't, don't um, tend to occur in places that already have technology. In some cases, when somebody complains about the camera, the existing camera in the room, I'm like, like just borrow a meeting out, yeah. okay, because it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, however, you, you also have people that will try to use it for things that it doesn't work for, right? Like, I want to stick this in the middle of my class of 36 students, and this is going to be a great tool. No, it's not. Right, and you have to have those conversations. So um, it's been great in that it's a plug and play device. It really helps to support Zoom meetings of a smaller fashion when everybody's around the same table. Um, and faculty, quite frankly, love the fact that it just, uh, the camera goes to whomever is speaking at that time and that it splits the screen. And it's like magic almost, people feel. So it's, um, it, that's been very successful. The other thing I try to push with faculty is realize that there's a second camera option when you're doing Zoom, right? We have a lot of faculty who want to, well, I need to annotate on the screen, but I don't have this. And I'm like, well, here's a little camera. Now it's a doc cam. <laughs> Switch to your other camera and use it, right? So um, the Doceo Center keeps um, four meeting owls uh, in the curriculum center that can be borrowed by faculty across campus at any time. Uh, we get a lot of faculty that they will try them out a few times and then they'll go back to their department and say, please buy us one of these, right? So, so having four is actually enough for me at this point. Um, we, we had two at one point and they were booked constantly, so I, I had to get more. Um, I also have some other cameras that they can use as that secondary camera for like a dot cam or whatever so that faculty don't need to purchase those things on their own. They just borrow them for the center, use them for whenever they're teaching and then turn them in when they're done. And, and I, so I try to support that in, in making them realize that that exists. Um, I also created a bunch of resources for faculty so that if they came to one of my trainings they had something to walk away with. So these are um, uh, resources that I created that just, you know, going through the Zoom menus, like what is possible in Zoom? Here's all the different menus, here's what they mean. Um, Zoom advanced features, then we'll walk them through like how do I use a breakout room? Um, how do I mute all of my participants upon entry? Right? Like these, these tips to faculty, these are the things you should be doing as an instructor, period, right? Always pick, always <laughs> select this button when you create a Zoom meeting because you want everybody muted when they enter your room. Go into your settings and mute yourself so that you're always muted when you enter a room. Um, you know, and just showing them that they do have control over things like that is important. Uh, sometimes showing them that they have control over looking at the statistics of their meeting so that they know, hey, this student, you know, jumped into your meeting, but they were only active for this amount of time, or they jumped back out a half an hour later. Like, a lot of faculty can't possibly notice that while they're teaching, 
but they want those stats. They want to follow up on stuff like that. So um, it, it's more of a question and answer thing, but I, when I do a Zoom training about the regular menus or the advanced features, I can usually expect like around 30 people to show up, which is pretty significant, right? And they're almost new people every time because again, we have more, more and more people using. And a mix of staff. And yes. Exactly. So you get staff, you get faculty. Um, in some cases, we get students who may have to support it to some extent. Um, uh, as far as I go, I've done trainings too for IT folks, right? Let's, let's take IT and show them, hey, these are the features the instructors are going to be interested in, and so these are things you need to know about. Um, so we did a, a training that was just for IT about those kinds of things. And I just wanted to ask, who all, is anybody using Zoom in the room? Okay, yeah. I think um, one of my favorite features, the, the thing that's totally sold me on it, was the ability to share screen without any per extra permissions. You, you can, anybody can share their screen, a student can sh share their screen, anybody who's in the meeting without um, being promoted, which was huge. And, um, and then <laughs> there's that one feature that like fixes your face. I can't remember what that. <laughs> the touch up. The touch up. Right. <gasps> I show people tap chub and they're like, oh my god. Everybody was writing it down. No, this was in there. Yeah, that's I don't in the have settings. To look like I'm half asleep during the <laughs> Yeah, so that so those are some of the benefits. And then just the fact that it's so reliable. Um, with Collaborate, we would have people coming into our office saying, it dropped out last night during my really important session um, with the old Collaborate. So we knew we needed to move to something a little more reliable. And it's been great and super user friendly. Um, and in, in covering the equipment thing too, um, then I, I get faculty who will come to, to me and say, hey, I want to use it, but I want to do this other thing, right? So last week it was somebody wanted to green screen, and I'm like, well, I don't have the equipment for that, but I've been meaning to do that, like meaning to start playing with that for a while. So let's just go ahead and order a green screening kit. And he looked at me and said, really? <laughs> and I said, yeah, it will belong to the center, but you can borrow it whenever you need it. And he was like, okay and <laughs> and so I said so email me the one you want right because I'm not gonna go pick it out for you like just show me the one you want so I, I ordered it this morning actually like a $700 green screen kit um, it's got like a nine foot um, you know green panel and a couple lights that come with it um, and it'll just belong to the curriculum center it'll get housed there and people can you know check it out as they need and during future sessions I'll get the word out so that's kind of like the Doceo Center's role in this is like always looking at the background and saying do we have enough tools to support this um, you know and and then offering the trainings based on the needs that I'm seeing at that point and sometimes the needs um, go up and down a little bit like we had a need for a while where people were like I know how to use zoom but I need to know how to use it in one of those special zoom rooms because I have no idea what I'm doing when I walk in there <laughs> right where it's already set up and they have to put in a zip code and a panel and they're like ah, I don't know how to do this so yeah it, it becomes a little bit different of a monster at that point yeah you were talking about um, Greg some some feature that you guys make a plug and play for instructors when they go into is that the engineering building oh yeah so we have uh, several rooms with cisco sx80 codecs and touch panels so what we do to make it easier for the faculty and staff to use those rooms is we'll preload the uh, favorites in the touch panel with instead of putting a meeting id or making them type the meeting id in every time we'll just put their course so it'll say English 101 section one and so they come in the room they just have to touch their section and same on the other end for the people learning at a distance in our centers and then they don't have to even mess with the meeting ID it's all magic for them well, that's the kind, of, the kind of support that we just love to to brag about um, in my center we've had a couple people just get confused about the meeting owl and it's really easy, but they just, they're, they're panicked a little bit. And so uh, we've made a little cheat sheet for them so that when they walk in there, they know exactly what they need to do. And the owl makes a little hoot sound when you plug it in, which is so really they cute. they don't expect my research assistant to set it up for them. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. really what that's about. <laughs> so just, I guess, these little, these little instances where we found ways to make it easier, we've always tried to, to accommodate that. 
Um, so the recordings, a um, little bit different. I think we've seen um, some evolution happening there where we started with people just kind of doing whatever. <laughs> and then the registrar said, well, we got maybe have some FERPA issues here. So we said, we probably need to make some protocols where um, we don't want them storing it on the cloud necessarily. We're running into space issues, I believe, with a lot of recordings that takes up a lot of space. Um, so we put it, uh, we, we put some instructions out there to save uh, your recordings out on the OneDrive in, in um, their file, uh, their U, or U drive on the S or U. And that seems to be working pretty well. Did you want to say anything about that? Um, just to add to the recording issue, when faculty talk to me about recording, um, the first question I ask them is, why do you want to record? Right? Because a lot of times they don't know the answer to that. Like, what are you trying to capture here? Are any of your students going to actually watch this after the fact? Are they, any of them required to watch this? Um, a lot of times faculty will say to me, well, in case they can't be there. And I'll say, well, do you expect your face-to-face -face students to be in class? You know, so, so I kind of argue with them a little bit before I say, record everything. Because they tend to just be like, let's just record everything. And um, I don't know that that's always the best case of, of what you could do. And then they get this backlog of they've recorded things automatically for so long and they've been throwing them somewhere that they're not really supposed to be and they've got student information in them. So, you know, you run into all these other issues like get them off of here and put them in the location they're supposed to be. And then unfortunately that's where IT has to come in and get in touch with them and say, hey, you've got all of these recordings out there, like we share this space, what are we going to do? So I, I try to have that conversation with them up front, like is this, why do you want to record it? And if there's a valid reason, then great, but if you're just recording it to say I have a recording of it, then you know, why? Um, yeah, and, and also making them understand, a lot of faculty think I can record these classes this semester and then I can just keep those recordings for the next, you know, three classes. You can't do that, right? You can't because if your students are speaking in those classes and you can't share that set of students with your next set of students. And, and tr so trying to just make them understand all the backgrounds of recording and, and what that means and what their limitations are, I think is really important before you even say, record your class. <laughs> and on the flip side of that, I've seen um, instructors who will use Zoom to do a recording with, with no students present. Yeah. And they will go out and save it and get the MP4, upload it to YouTube, they get the auto captioning there, and it's working well for them. So they, they love it so much, they're just finding all these new creative ways to use it, which I think is really cool. So here we've got instructions, I think I sent this to someone a month ago on how to um, share your Zoom recordings in, uh, from, from your OneDrive files. So just a quick set of instructions that we're sharing with people there. So that's kind of been our story of how we support Zoom, but we, we're always looking for ways to improve. So I think uh, one thing I'd like to see and I try to um, emphasize when I talk to faculty is if you're having a Zoom session at the very beginning of class, make sure that you walk the students through how to use it. You know, Tell them how to do the hand raised. Tell them to mute before they come in. Um, do you want cameras? Do you not want cameras? So making sure students know exactly how they're supposed to be using it and the best way that, to use it. Um, making sure they're aware of the FERPA issues. And then um, I would like to see um, more active learning in the synchronous sessions. Like I think we could do a lot more um, you know, projects and group sessions and kind of you know, uh, interesting, effective, uh, meaningful learning activities in that, in that format. Um, so Carrie and I organize a couple events every year on campus. Um, one of them in the fall is um, teaching with, what is it, teaching with technology? Is that what it's called? Or teaching and learning with technology? Sure. Something like that. Um, <laughs> that event we organize, we always try to make sure that there is a mix of people who are going to focus on this is what I do in my face-to-face -face class, this is what I do in my online class, right? So always having some sessions applying to online teaching. We have a lot of faculty on campus who only teach online, you know, so they, they really need that. We also have a lot of people who are using um, a hybrid model now. 
right? Half their students are there with them and the other half are connecting from a distance and trying to get used to that juggle. Um, so making sure that there are people that present on that as well and, and trying to balance that. We then do an active learning symposium every um, spring. Um, so we're at our fourth annual this year for the Active Learning Symposium. Uh, we honestly do like a half day and it's um, four sessions, is it five sessions? So it's 16, so it's four sessions and there's four um, different uh, topics to choose from at each session time. So we have 16 different speakers throughout the day. And these are all faculty that are using it in different ways or we might uh, occasionally have like a staff member who's using it to support meetings in a different way. So we try to give as many examples as possible of, of different things that are that are happening with active learning in general but then making sure that we've got those plugins for here's how somebody is utilizing it in this online space, right, or in this video conferencing space and I think that is about all we have for you guys anyone have questions yes sir so, in the back so because zoom rooms are pretty much focus just on using Zoom, right? You can't use Adobe Connect and Skype and all the other things in those rooms. We had a little bit of pushback on that. People would show up to that room expecting to be able to use any soft codec. Department really like the Zoom room. They schedule it, they use the scheduling function of it. So the room just automatically is connected when they walk in, it disconnects. They don't have to deal with much. Um, the sharing features in it are are fairly nice too but yeah we've only got half a dozen zoom rooms here let's uh let's play with the catch box here <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. so it gets on the catch box okay uh, so i do notice in your stats somewhere that, that you also uh, are it's been used in china and i know zoom offers a uh like get through the firewall of china option upgrade um do you use that or is the standard zoom just fine yeah, we've just been using the standard Did Zoom. You? Okay, yeah. no pushback from quality or anything. From Not yet, anyway. Okay. <laughs> but Thanks. thank you for the heads up. <laughs> <laughs> and I can speak to that for one second. Um, I think, you know, coming to start using Zoom, I was supporting like six tools prior to landing on Zoom. And then I just t started redirecting faculty and saying, quit using this thing. Start using Zoom. This is the one we support. Um, and it, it's been a, a better um, experience for a lot of the end users. And so getting them to always focus on the end user um, and their experience, I think, was important in it. Yeah. yeah, just a quick question on, um, do you guys take advantage of some of the added features like the signage or scheduling that, uh, that Zoom offers in some of those Zoom room kind of pieces? Just uh, the Zoom rooms, uh, we just played with it a little. We don't have a university-wide scheduling system that's tapped into Zoom. It doesn't, we've got R25, but we're not linking those two things together. Uh, the people that are using it are just using Outlook to, uh, to make the schedule within their own department. With its plug-in. Yep. Um, if if a lot of instructors are using it for student presentations and everything, um, isn't that a fairly common request to record uh, for grading purposes? And what would that response be to them? Um, so the people that we see mainly record are usually um, graduate level faculty that are teaching grad courses where maybe there's presentations that are done within the grad course and they have to grade those or something like that. So yeah, we definitely support that. We just show them, you know, here's how you auto save your meetings. That's been a huge thing, like just showing them that there's an auto save function because a lot of people will be like, oh, I forgot to save this meeting. Now what do I do? Well. There's nothing I can do for you, um, <laughs> right? So showing them it's, if it's pertinent that you save this meeting, make sure you have it on auto record, and then you don't have to think about that when you're teaching. So yeah, we, we do um, make sure that they just house their videos in the appropriate spot so that the students only have access to them and nobody else. Yeah. 
So in your classroom environments where you're using a conjunction of a live classroom plus Zoom to bring in outside students, what technologies are you incorporating so that you're capturing all the audio in the space plus video of the instructor and what's being sent via the computer or document camera? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. We don't do any, uh, we don't have a lecture capture system. So when they're recording to Zoom, in our classrooms, we have uh, like Shure's 910 series microphone. That's, that's an eight lobe beam forming mic that catches pretty much the whole room. In one of those rooms, the instructor has a separate lob so we can, they can wander around a bit more and be more present. Um, that's generally how we do it. We try to mic the entire room. It has you know, its own pitfalls too because people have a squeaky chair, you know, that gets on the recording and everything else too. Okay, and what about um, the camera for capturing the instructor? Um, is it just a webcam or is there a camera mounted on like the back In wall? the rooms that have Cisco equipment, there are two of Cisco's uh, Precision 60 cameras. So there's one that faces the instructor from the rear of the room and the other one faces the class from the front of the room and it's generally set on a wide shot because instructors are, don't really want to manipulate it, but they, we did put presets in so they can do like this quarter of the room and, and change it, move it around. We just installed our first tracking camera for somebody just last week where it'll voice track, but that's the only one. How, how's that functionality been? Because we, we've tried using tracking with beaded devices using IR and finding depending on the clothing or how the instructor stands, it's not very reliable. Yeah, so it's a Cisco product that we installed. So that one uses the microphones first to kind of generalize where the voice is coming from. And then it's got some facial recognition that it'll try to frame a head to a headshot. It's not 100% reliable, but it's better, I guess, than nothing. All right, thank you. Um, we also have faculty that will come and say, I want to record my Zoom in this room, and they don't even realize they're in a room that's not really equipped to handle Zoom. Um, so that happens a lot, right? And I'm like, okay, well, we have to add a few pieces in to make that work for you. Is it okay if we set it up this way? In some cases, I know that they're going to just be um, a little bit over my head in terms of things and I say you need to get in touch with the Zoom guys and get in touch with IT and see if they can set something up for you. Um, in other cases we say hey let's see if a room is available at that time <laughs> so that you can just switch over to that room and make it work. Um, we have some rooms that we put in um, microarray systems after the fact like we already had the cameras and things in those rooms but we didn't have the necessary audio to be doing a full um, room of, of people and recording it so so we set some of those in um, but the other thing that we have I, I think a lot when it comes to the recording is a lot of our um, hybrid courses there might be like 12 students in the room and so they really are just all sitting around one table and um, they're primarily using the owl um, for those because that's enough audio for them and it handles the video really well and, and so that's you know the, the only thing that they really need in those spaces when they're only talking about that many students present. Yeah. Oh, so there's some new things we're doing for the recording too. There's a camera called a Hudley. I don't know if you guys have seen that one but it uses some artificial intelligence to actually track faces as people are walking in the room and then it'll keep count and it'll adjust its shot and if somebody gets up and leaves it notices that and it narrows down the shot. Um, that's something that we, we have ordered. We haven't built it in the room yet but we're doing it for our medical school. And the other thing is, and Biamp I think has it here, the Devio. If you guys have seen that, we just put one of those in a huddle room just last week. So it's got a, a little beamforming pendant mic that hangs from the ceiling and a little bit of mini DSP that uh, will go into your computer. So it kind of makes you a really good I.O. for sound in, into a standard computer. And it's true that uh, being tracked, too. So it's not yeah. set to be Yeah. Um, and another thing I can add to that is that I also show some faculty who, who are teaching where there are students dialing in from another campus that they have far end control of the camera. <laughs> Right, so just turning that feature on in their Zoom meetings so that they can go in there and, and turn the camera at a distance to 
figure out, hey, do I have any students this week in Idaho Falls? Because students will hide from the camera, right? They know where it's placed in the room and they'll like go over in the corner and then the instructor's like, All right, is there anybody out there? You know, um, They typically though don't know anything beyond that, right? They don't know how to mute themselves and unmute themselves and those kinds of things. So uh, it, it's kind of funny, but showing, showing faculty who are in that position that they do have the control to scan the room, see who's there. And then if the students sitting over in the corner and there's only two students there, then let's put the camera on them, right? Um, I also tell faculty that when uh, you, you have faculty who teach and it's prim their primary teaching tool and they are having a synchronous meeting, um, don't be frightened to tell your students that they have to keep their cameras turned on. That's them being present in your class, right? So um, we do have a lot of faculty that require that now that you know your camera will be turned on while you are in my course, you know while we're live connected, and that's just sort of an expectation that they have. But mute your microphone. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned the classes possibly moving them, to, and you use R25. Does the Registrar keep track of what rooms are Zoom capable, and can they request that when they schedule the room? They do, yeah. It's part of, they have a, a room asset list for each room mm -hmm. that tells whether it has multimedia capabilities or video capabilities. And we also have a knowledge base articles as part of our Team Dynamics uh, ticketing system that we keep those out there, letting people know what capabilities rooms have. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's the one thing about a catch box is uh, yeah. sometimes it can get a little interesting. Um, one of the things that we're dealing with, we, we have WebEx at UNLV, and one of the things we're dealing with is recording quotas because we only have X amount of space allotted to us in the cloud. Do you guys ever, do you have to assign a quota to individual people? If you do, what is it? And do you even have an option to just say, all right, after 30 days, anything that's there is gone? Because that's kind of a double-edged sword when we're trying to think about yeah, how to enforce uh, that. We, we ran upon that initially. I think we had like 50 gig of storage, and we were always up against it. When we got our site license, they gave us seven terabytes. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't run up against that. But we do keep an eye on things. And if they're getting very old and haven't been watched, then we'll call those users or email them and say, you really need to keep this. Um, I wish we had a better system. We don't. Uh, we're going to redeem. Or re <laughs> so we were running into that same problem. Um, I'm at OSU. We use Kaltura, and we did the, the plug connection so that everything just automatically goes to Kaltura. And we don't deal with any of the storage on WebEx or Zoom. Well, maybe Zoom. But um, so that's one thing to look at if you're using a platform. Yeah, it's a dream of mine is having Kaltura take all of that. And then I don't, they can have the security set up and everything for us. So I wasn't sure if this was in bad form or not, but I'm with Kaltura. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that, that intro. And what's the NW Met uh, discount this week? There's. <laughs> But there is an option to take those recordings and get them lined up with the class and whether it's, we have them for both WebEx and for Zoom. And then you can either do, uh, yeah, I'll just put it out there. So unlimited bandwidth and storage is a distinct possibility as well. Um, uh, but just to inform you guys a little bit more, even when we do that, it comes with a standard set of uh, rules that we apply to it. And that is after two years of an entry or an asset hasn't been played, then we'll strip out all what we call the flavors, the just different versions of the file that we keep. And then after four years, um, if that file still hasn't been played, then it's removed off the system. It's just deleted. Now there are custom iterations of that that are available as well, right? But that's just our standard policy as we think about how we do this stuff. So, sorry to interrupt. Sounds good. So, you said the magic words, site license. Yeah. Because uh, we were an early Zoom adopter. The state of Washington bought licenses and doled them out to the six state universities. And at the time, Zoom wasn't thinking of site licenses for education. So, what have you gotten? How do I get it? <laughs> yeah, um, we just worked with our Zoom rep, and you know, they were familiar with our growth and what we started with. Um, so the package we have is just roughly about $59,000 to cover our entire faculty and, and student population. 
uh, we probably have more webinar licenses than we need and we may negotiate that into more licenses for students or something as we expand, like give up a few webinars and get more student seat licenses. So right now it's working well, but we have to watch the growth. I think that's important. Yeah, just making sure we're, we have enough. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thanks so much, you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you.